Stephen's been preaching through the book of Mark. Next week he will preach on the ending of the book of Mark. And he's asked me to fit into his series. And I'm going to preach on the ending of the book of Mark today. <laughs> now, that, that sounds confusing and it sounds paradoxical, so I need to do some explaining. You, do you know when printing was invented? Any advance on 15? 14, yeah, <laughs> late, 1400, late 1400s, mid to late 1400s, uh, the, the invention of movable type printing. Before that, all books, every single book in the world before that, had to be copied by hand. Now, in theory, it was possible to have produced books other ways because you could have made woodcuts of each page uh, and made books that way, but they didn't. So, every book in the world, until the mid to late 1400s, was hand-copied. Think about that, because it has a profound implication, it has a number of profound implications, but one of them is a profound implication for the nature of books. When we think of books, we think of these printed objects, and each copy of the book is the same. Now, okay, occasionally there are second editions, and the second edition might be a bit different. Um, But the main picture in our head is that when we say some particular book, every copy of it is the same. It wasn't like that in the ancient world. When an author wrote a book, (laughs) when the time came to make other copies, they had a choice to make. They could either make another copy the same as the first one, Or they can make another copy a bit different. Now, I don't know about you, but I love um, using my computer to type in words because one of the things it lets me do is just that. It lets me go back to the age when I could change what I've written and move it around and put the things in a different order. And By and large, the Bible isn't like that, but there are a couple of places where it is. One of them is the book of Jeremiah where there are two editions of the book of Jeremiah, one of them a seventh shorter than the other, and with the material in a slightly different order. The other place where it happens quite dramatically is at the end of the book of Mark. And the copies of the book of Mark that we have, the, ancient, the most ancient copies of the book of Mark that we have, um, have basically two different ways of ending the book. Um, it's slightly more complicated that because there is a third. Um, <laughs> But, but the third is, is not very popular. There's only, I think it's only one major copy of it. And, so, and it, it just misses out a little bit. So it, it might be a mistake. But there are two um, well-attested versions of the ending of the book of Mark. Um, and next week, Stephen's going to focus on the long ending. So I'm focusing on the short ending. Um, The short ending, on the whole, isn't very popular with Bible translators. So you may find that your Bible um, doesn't even indicate that there is a short ending, and it may well miss out the last verse or half verse um, of the short ending. Um, We'll come back to that. So if we can... So, Mark chapter 16... When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They'd been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He's not here. Look, there's the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, that, for they were afraid, is where the shortest ending of Mark ends. That's the really short ending. 
Um, most copies um, of the short ending have another little bit. And all that had been commanded them, they told briefly to those around Peter. And afterward, Jesus himself sent out through them from east and west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. Now, if you look in your Bible, and hopefully you've got your Bible and you can look, you'll find that there are another, um, well, verses 9 to nine to 20, um, which, which Pete Stephen's going to be preaching on next week. That's the long ending of the book of Mark. Now, we don't know quite what happened. We, we don't know if, uh, if um, Mark produced two versions, one after the other, and wasn't sure which one was better, um, or, or what. Um, but that, that's the way I like to think about it, um, because that makes sense to me. As someone who likes to, to juggle my words around and move paragraphs and all that sort of thing, it kind of makes sense to me that, that Mark had, had two goes at ending the gospel, and he couldn't pick between them. And in, in his day, he didn't have to. He just said, well, we'll copy both of them. And so we've got copies of both endings of the book of Mark. Um, a lot of people don't like the short ending. They don't like it because it ends, for they were afraid. Which, if you've been reading Mark's Gospel, in some ways doesn't seem quite the right way to end the Gospel. You know how Mark's Gospel all the way through has been punchy and short. And how all the way through it's hammered home the message that Jesus is the Son of God, Jesus is the Saviour, the Messiah. Um, and so, to end, for they were afraid, um, seems like a bit of an anticlimax. Um, even if you do add the coda about the imperishable good news going out around the world. But I don't think it is, so let's look more closely at this short ending. So, this is how the short ending goes. There are some important things about it. Firstly, it makes sure that at the end of the Gospel you remember that the Jesus who's been talked about since the beginning of the Gospel is the one who was crucified. Because Mark's Gospel, from beginning to end, makes no sense if you don't remember that Jesus is the Jesus who was crucified. Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, who died on a cross. Jesus is the one who came to redeem the world, who was executed. And so it's there, clear, right at the end. Again, please. Not just the one who was crucified, though, but he is also the one who has been raised. This, too, the young man says to these terrified women at the grave. It's not just that the body has gone. It's more than that. The Jesus who was crucified is the Jesus who has risen to new life. And it's really important that you get that. And so this messenger at the grave tells the women. So... Get both things in your head. This Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Redeemer who's come, is the one who was crucified. He's also the one who is risen. And then click again. But he's not here. You see, a couple of times in Jesus' ministry, there were people who died. Uh, Jairus' daughter and Lazarus. And by miracle, Jesus raised them to life. What happened to them after that? Yeah, I mean, we don't know, but presumably they went, well, they went on living for a, for a good while. Jairus' daughter for probably a very long while since she was young. Um, Lazarus perhaps for a bit less long because he was a mature man at the time. Um, but they carried on with a, with a normal human life. Jesus' resurrection is different. It wasn't just the resuscitation of a corpse, it was something, something new and different in the world. And so, it's important to notice that this Jesus who died, this Jesus who rose, um, isn't here. Um, no longer part of this earth. But, if you can click again, go tell his disciples and Peter, and that and Peter's rather nice, you can make a whole sermon out of that, um, that he's going ahead of you to Galilee, for there you will see him just as he told you. So, he's not here, but he's still here. Now, how does that work? Yep, it is. Um, 
He's not, no longer part of this, this earth, this world, but you're still in contact with him. There, there is still a connection. It's not that he's simply gone. And you see, all of those things are important. If the Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah that we proclaim is not the one who died on the cross, then he's worthless. If the Son of God, the Messiah who we proclaim, simply died on the cross, he's useless. But if he'd risen to an ordinary human life, it would be a fine story, but it wouldn't be a story we're still telling 2,000 years later. It's the fact that his resurrection was different from just resuscitation um, that, that gives it ongoing significance. But if he wasn't the one that continues to talk to us, uh, then, uh, again, it would be something which was a once-off curiosity but long ago forgotten. It's when you put all those things together that you get the story of Jesus that makes good news, that rings around the world and has rung, rung around the world for 2,000 years. So all the important bits Mark has put together in the speech by this angel at the, or the young man uh, dressed in white at, at, at the tomb to make sure we get it at the end. But then we get to the puzzle, if you can click again. For they were afraid. What's going on there? Is there any way to end a gospel, Mark? Have you got any clues? If you've been listening to Stephen's sermons, he's already given you a big clue. Have you ever come across before in Mark places where people were afraid? Mm -hmm. Some nods? Well, let, let's look at them. Here are the first three places in Mark where the, the verb to fear occurs. When Jesus quieted the storm, so there's a powerful, terrifying act of nature in this storm that the, 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 the fisher, fishermen on the sea were, were frightened of. You know, there are storms and storms. There are storms that are exciting and there are storms that are terrifying. And this one had Peter and the other fishermen terrified. And Jesus stills it. And when they see that, they're filled with great awe and they say to one another, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? They recognize who Jesus is or they begin to recognize who Jesus is. They recognize that Jesus has power over the powers of nature. And they're frightened. Second one. Uh, next chapter. In chapter... Chapter 5, verse 15, there's that story where there's the man with the, the host of uh, demons in him, and Jesus casts the demons out into the pigs. So, a dramatic cure of uh, a, a, an illness that was not of the normal kind of this world. They came to Jesus and saw the demoniac sitting there, clothed in his right mind, the very man who had had the legion. And they were afraid. This time, not, not the disciples, but the, the, the wider crowd. See that this Jesus has power over the powers that, 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 that oppress. And their response is fear. This is Mark telling us what it means to, to be afraid. Because these are the first two times he's used it. Third time, later in chapter 5. So notice that these ones are clustered together. Um, end of chapter 4, middle of chapter 5, towards the end of chapter 5. Um, Jesus is on his way to, to, to Jairus' house. And a woman touches his, 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 touches his, his, his cloak. And, and she's, she's cured. And uh, he says, who touched me? And everybody else says, look, there's a crowd around you. Thousands of people have touched you. What's going on? But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Because the power of her, her illness has been taken away and she realizes that Jesus 
really is someone special. And the response to recognising that Jesus is Son of God, Messiah, is fear. Mark's teaching us what fear really is. If you can click again. So, end of chapter 4, middle of chapter 5, end of chapter 5, and now right at the end of chapter 5, um, when Jairus' daughter is raised, uh, sorry, uh, just, just before Jairus' daughter is raised, they've been talking about the fact that she's dead. Overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. The opposite of fear is trust. And believe in the Bible nearly always has over, uh, strong overtones, more of trust than it does of belief in the sense of, um, I, I believe the song will write, no, because there's trust there too, but you know what I mean. More than, more than the sense of giving intellectual assent to, it means trusting. And so here, the contrast is fear or trust. So, Mark's sharpening up what this fear thing is all about. Because its opposite is trusting God. Now, that's going to get complicated, because, uh, but, but bear with me. Um, it, chap- in verse 20 of chapter 6, um, there's just ordinary fear talked about. These, I'm giving you, so far, all of the times when Mark uses this verb to fear. So, one where it's ordinary, f- everyday fear. Then, at the end of chapter 6, where Jesus walked on the water... For they all saw him and were terrified. And immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it's I, be not afraid. Mark sharpening it up. When you recognise who Jesus is, when you recognise that Jesus is Son of God, God among us, then the appropriate response is to be afraid. Not very afraid, but afraid. But... The opposite of fear is trust. Put the two together, and what you've got is what you've got here. They see him walking on the water, they're terrified. Don't worry, it's me. Don't be afraid, it's me. Because trust is the opposite of fear. Yeah, that's good. Leave it there. Uh, yeah, click the next time. Uh, click the next time to bring it all up. Sorry, I had... Oh, no, but back. Uh, that's it. Sorry about that. Um, now, Mark's Gospel told us at the beginning it was a Gospel. It's the only one that does. Good news is right there at the front of the Gospel. And it's right there at the end, however you see the ending. And all the way through, the, Mark's Gospel has been about... The gospel, the good news. So we need to put these two things, this fear that the short ending ends with, uh, and the good news together. And we need to see how they work together. Because separately, they're no good. Well, no, that's not quite right, but you know what I mean. Um, separately, they're not, not as good as together. Um, but... Through the Gospel, he's been telling us, when people start to recognise that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, they are afraid. Why is that? It's because God is not like us. God is different from us. Did anyone go outside last yesterday evening, last night? Did you look up at the sky? Did you see the stars? Wasn't it impressive? Um, after, after so many evenings recently when it's been cloudy, there they all were. Well, of course, not all of them. Um, because y- your eyes and my eyes aren't good enough. We can't see all of them. The, the scientists with their telescopes, the astronomers uh, at the tops of mountains, they can see literally um, many, 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 many times more stars than we can. Now, that, that, that's a number I can't even begin to imagine. And then, uh, they do complicated measurements and they start to tell me how far away the stars are. And astronomers measure distance in all kinds of really complicated numbers. 
The sun, for example, is, what is it, nine light minutes away? Because it takes the, li- the light, I think it's nine minutes, to, to get from the sun to us. The nearest star is, I think it's ten light years away. Uh, that's the nearest star. The other ones that we can't see, but that they can with their powerful telescopes, are way, 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 and I don't know how many ways to put in there, further away from us than that. It's mind-bogglingly big. And God made it. Doesn't that make you feel small? To feel small, you don't have to imagine the stars. Just go out and stand at the top of a cliff. Now, um, you may not be frightened of heights, I am. Um, If I go stand at the top of a cliff, I am terrified. Um, If there's there's a good, strong rail, then um, maybe I'm a bit happier. Um, But I get pretty frightened just climbing a a, a ladder. Um, So the top of a cliff, I'm terrified. But when you stand at the top of a cliff and you look out, almost always what you get is this magnificent view. Somehow or other they put cliffs, God puts cliffs in places where there are magnificent views. Even if the magnificent view is just the sea with all those waves. That's what fear is. It's recognising your own smallness recognising the incredible, um, beautiful bigness of the world and recognising that God made it. That in that incredible, beautiful bigness of the world, there is a small echo of God. And it is only a small echo. You know, if you go and stand on a cliff here in New Zealand and you look out across the Pacific Ocean, um, well, for a start, all you can see is the first tiny little bit of the Pacific Ocean. Um, The rest of it is hidden round the bend of the earth. And then, of course, the Pacific Ocean is only uh, a decent fraction of the globe. And this globe is only a tiny fraction of the solar system. And, uh, And God made it. But it's more than that. It's not just that God is unimaginably big. It is also that God is holy. God is pure. And we aren't. The appropriate response to recognizing that Jesus is the Son of God is not to shake his hand and say hello. It's to be afraid. But, this gospel that Mark's been on about since the beginning is good news. And if the appropriate response on meeting the Son of God is to be afraid, and only that, it's not good news. It's about the worst news you could get, really. But, did you notice how that um, coda... Um, a coda in music is, is a little bit you put after the, after the, after the music has finished, um, which somehow or other kind of joins it all together, ties it up, and finishes it even more properly. And um, that's the best way I can explain it. Um, some of you, I think, are music teachers or musicians. You can probably explain it better. Um, but that's roughly what a coda is. And the little coda to Mark's Gospel, um, the short version of Mark's Gospel, says, and all that they've been commanded them they told briefly to those around Peter, and afterwards Jesus himself sent them out from east and west, sorry, sent, uh, sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. And that's good news. That this Jesus is Son of God, Messiah, Savior, that this Jesus died on the cross, rose from death on the cross, is no longer here among us, but is yet still with us. That's good news. 
it's good news that Mark has been telling us all the way through the gospel. Right at the beginning, chapter 2, he tells us that this good news is forgiveness. That our brokenness, because we are all part of a broken world since Genesis chapter 3, um, and as part of that broken world since Genesis chapter 3, we too are broken. The good news of the coming of Jesus is good news that that brokenness is forgiven and is on the way to being mended. Now, okay, as you look around you, or as you look inside you, you know that that mending has not yet been completed. But we are on the way to being mended. One day, what is broken in us will be put right. And then, in chapters 4 and 5, where we kept reading about fear, remember, we keep being told about how Jesus, the Son of God, um, puts other things in the world right. He's in control of the powers of sickness, the powers of demons, the powers of wind and storm. All of those powers. And that is good news. So at the same time, as the appropriate response is to be afraid, the appropriate response is also, if you trust, to be delighted. And that's how trust and fear come together. It's when you have both. That recognizing Jesus as the Son of God and Messiah is good news. If you only recognize Jesus as the Son of God and Messiah, and you are not afraid, you you don't have that response of awe, then you haven't really recognized who he is. But if you don't go on from that that, that, that awe, that terror standing at the edge of the cliff, um, and recognize that he can be trusted, and put your trust in him, then you haven't really recognized who he is. It's when the fear and the trust come together that you've got it. Click again. Back in the Old Testament, uh, one of the slogans, it runs through the wisdom books. We were talking about the wisdom books in Know and Love Your Bible, uh, not not last week, but the one before. Um, One of the slogans that runs through the wisdom books is, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You see, you haven't even begun to get it until you recognize that God is so big and so other than us that it's terrifying. And that God is so holy and we are so broken that it's terrifying. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's where you start from. It's not the end, it's the beginning. If you don't start from there, you haven't started. There's that old hymn, um, through the changing scenes of life, in trouble and in joy, and there's that line in it, fear him, ye saints, and uh, and you will then have nothing else to fear. You see, if, if the thing you fear is the God who made everything. And if your fear includes trust, both together, not not separated, then there is absolutely nothing in this universe else that you need to be afraid of. The trouble is, we human beings like to be in control. We are all, to a greater or lesser extent, control freaks. Some of us more, some of us less. Um, but those of you who are less, don't be too proud of it, because you are too. <laughs> we love to be in control. And we are more or less terrified when we're not in control. Are you one of those people who sits there in the passenger seat with your foot on the brakes? <laughs> You see, we like to be in control, and when we aren't in control, we are terrified. We hate to admit that we're afraid. 
Have you ever seen a, a little boy uh, faced with something that's a bit frightening? You know what he does, and little girls do it too. It's just that uh, our culture um, expects it more of little boys for some reason. What you do when you're really terrified of something, when you're really, really small, is you pretend you're not. And you go on doing it all your life. It's only we notice it more in little boys and little girls because they actually do stand up straighter. Um, Adults pretend not to. Um, We hate being afraid. We love being in control. And that's the big problem. You see, if we really recognize who Jesus is, Son of God, Messiah, God among us. Then we recognize that we are not in control, never have been and never will be. And we recognize that we ought to be afraid. And we can't stand those two things. And so we kind of push it it away. And that's why I like this ending of Mark's Gospel, the short one. It's a reminder that we need to recognize who Jesus is. Son of God, Messiah, the one who died, the one who rose. God among us. And we need to recognize that he is awesomely different from us. But we need also to learn to trust him. Because when we get to the end of Mark's Gospel, we're encouraged to put those two together. If you can click once more, and then we're finished. One of the, one of the themes that runs through uh, the C.S. Lewis Narnia books um, that I haven't read, though I've seen some of the films, um, but one of the bits about those books that really impressed me is that line, that um, uh, Aslan is not a tame lion. I think that's a lovely picture of God. And that's the picture I want to leave with you. Um, Because there are many animals that are a bit frightening. Um, Standing next to an elephant is a little bit worrying. And they're just so big. Um, Snakes are a bit worrying because you never know if they're poisonous or not. Um, But I think there's something specially frightening about lions. Um, we went to Auckland Zoo not long after they installed that big bit, big pane of glass um, in the lion enclosure. Uh, and I had our, our Sarah with me, who at that stage was of an age to be holding my hand. Um, and this big male lion came bounding over and jumped up onto the pane of glass. And although I knew the pane of glass was there and had been tested to however many thousands of pounds per square inch or kilo, kilos per square centimetre of pressure and all the rest of it, I don't know about Sarah, but I was terrified. <laughs> Lions are frightening. And when you see one close like that, you realise why they're frightening, because you see those big teeth and you know what lions eat. And C.S. Lewis chose a lion to be his picture of God. Because, of course, a lion is a wonderful picture of the, the power of God. Just as long as we don't make the mistake of thinking that Aslan is a tame lion. You see, too often we want God to be a kind of stuffed toy lion that we can carry around with us and hug. And it makes us feel good. But that's not what God is like. And the, ending of God, uh, the short ending of Mark's Gospel reminds us that that's not what God is like. Aslan is not a tame lion. But a lion you can trust. And you have to keep those two together. If you have fear without trust, you're lost. But if you have trust without fear, you're you're mistaken, you're confused. Let's pray. Lord, we can't imagine how wondrously big you are. Just imagining that you made the, the stuff we can see around us is hard enough. Imagining that you made the complexity of our hands, where all the bits pull together and work, blows our minds. Imagining you as creator of the universe which is bigger than we can imagine 
blows our minds even more. And then we recognize that you are holy, pure. And we recognize that we aren't, never have been, and only occasionally manage to pretend to be for short periods of time. And that blows our minds in a different way. But Lord, we see you in Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Redeemer. And as we see you in Jesus, we learn to trust you. Lord, we're a bit like Thomas. Our trust is weak. Make it stronger. Help us to put away the tame stuffed lion and to learn to fear and trust the real God. Amen.